Welcome to the Stanley Street Social Podcast. We're recording today in Girona, and I'm here with a uh, rookie of the EF Education First Team, James Whelan. Welcome, James. You're back. Yeah. Good to speak again. The last time we spoke was uh, the day before I left yeah. um, for Europe. So, yeah, it's cool to catch up again. And, uh, yeah, welcome to my, my new home. Yeah, it's actually a really good spot here in the old town. Good view. And, um, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. How are you enjoying it, being in Spain and this is your new home? Yeah, it's great. Uh, it took a lot of work to to sort of get comfortable here, um, to get the new place set up, get all the little knickknacks to make it feel like home. But I think uh, with all the racing and, and traveling a bit and often I've only just really just settled. Um, but yeah, feeling pretty comfortable here. Um, it's got a nice little view over Old Town and yeah, the weather's just getting good again. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's pretty nice, yeah. I've only really had one month of, of iffy weather and then it's good good weather again like the Australian summer. So, yeah, it's all, all is going well. Off to no- uh, Norway tomorrow for the tour of Norway. What are the biggest challenges that you face getting set up? Did you get everything done before you came over in February or was there a lot of bits and pieces to, to finish up, get the final bits and pieces done? Yeah, the, I mean, there wasn't really a whole lot to do. Um, last year, I had three months uh, with my stagiaire period that I was able to organize my apartment um, and just make like learn learn the space, learn the learn the suburbs, learn learn the roads. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, over the last few months, it's been more just buying small things for the apartments, like plates and, yeah. and small things like that. And did and you just, always forget that actually you need yeah, to go and get? Yeah, yeah, and just uh, coming back to a place to make it feel like home. Um, but, uh, and also just living in this space, I think, uh, now I'm finally comfortable and I'm pretty happy to come back to this, this little pocket each time from a race. So, yeah. How was the team in, in helping you out and the other riders? Have they yep. helped you settle a lot? Yeah. Well, obviously, uh, the team has a lot of riders and a lot of the staff that live here. Um, so I can always reach out to, uh, to staff or riders and they've been really good with their time. Um, Particularly, yeah, guys like Mike Woods and and Mitch Docker, and just going on long training rides with them, and uh, they tell me stories about their early days and what to do and what not to do. Yeah. Um, and being like the real rookie of the team, everyone has their little input and their little bit of advice, which has been awesome. Um, and obviously, not everything I can soak up, but I've just trying to learn as much as possible from the guys. Yeah. And the team service courses in town. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah, what's yeah. that? Is that must be a huge benefit to have that here? Yeah, it's it's great. It's only about five k down the road, um, and it's definitely a luxury. Like if something goes wrong with the bike, I don't have to wait for a bike shop to open. I can just um, hit up one of the staff and ask if the service course is open, if there's a mechanic in, or even if um, there's a part that's broken on my bike and just go in and get it myself, um, as opposed to having that slow turnaround period with other teams. Um, but yeah, and just having the staff on call, um, just to catch up with them, us, and they can see how I'm going as well. Um, it's definitely great that we can have a close relationship like that. Um, but uh, obviously, there's some riders that like to, after a race, like to get away from it all. But um, I think as a as a neo pro, it's pretty handy having the resources. Just yeah, the next block down. So, that's so great. What, what do you do when you're back at base? You come back from a race. You're back yep. in town. Do you, do you try and socialise or do you try and just, you know, relax back in your apartment and get ready to go again? Yeah. I mean, for me, this was a big thing for me to work out. Um, obviously, I have my, my life back in Australia. I have my, my mojo, what I kind of do and what I enjoy doing there. Um, and obviously, the last few months, I've just been trying to work out, uh, you know, what I, what I enjoy doing, what's, what works well with training, what works well with recovery. And obviously, there's a fine line between training 20 hours a day um, and also being like having time for yourself and life outside of bikes. Yeah. Um, but there's also a lot of other cyclists that live around here that are my age, um, whether they're at the World Tour or Pro Conti level or Conti level. Um, there's a good little crew of yeah, a bunch of lads that I've kind of got close with. So um, I've been catching up with them for coffees and. And all that stuff. Not so much beers because uh, it's, it's early in the season and everyone's chasing <laughs> the results. But, that um, comes later in the piece, doesn't maybe, it? Maybe, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to that part in, in October perhaps. But, um, yeah, I mean, for me, to, being in a new space, um, I really like to work out, 
you know, just small things like working out where the good pool is, um, working out where the good gym is. And for me, uh, like swimming and stuff is a good, good form of recovery and just working out where I can go for that. And then uh, obviously with training, got new roads, don't have any crits to do. So I actually have to do a lot of efforts now. Yeah. And that's a, that, that's a big change in itself um, and not having big bunch rides to do in Australia. Um, you've really got to knuckle down a little bit and just uh, treat it a bit more seriously. Um, and you've got to be definitely got to be comfortable in your own space for sure. But uh, as I said, there's a, a good community of, of Aussies and Kiwis and Americans that, that all live here. Obviously, the non-Europeans have to come here because they don't have a home for the European race yeah. season. So a lot come here. But uh, yeah, I've, I'm thoroughly enjoying my time here. Um, yeah, that, that, would be the, that would be the door. <laughs> um, yeah. So just going over all that, what's been the biggest challenge that you've faced since moving, moving to Spain? Uh, probably the biggest thing uh, that I took for granted was, oh, like back in Australia, I still live at home. Um, and life's pretty easy when you're living with five other people who, who look after your ha- you have the house for you, often look after your, uh, I don't know, just like the supermarket stuff. Yeah. And once that's all uh, put onto you and then also the amount of training that I do, often my day is pretty full. Um, so I just find myself training going to supermarkets, going to the pool, and that's pretty much my day done. Um, but, uh, yeah, you've got to be uh, pretty productive and organised if you want to do it all well. So, um, yeah, I mean, just being organised is probably the biggest thing. Yeah, And also just uh, coming home from a race and resetting and making sure that I don't just go straight back into training like I want to. Yeah. Um, I think that's one thing that I learned after the UAE tour. It's a pretty big, stressful week. And then I think I had one rest day and I was like, right, I'm just going to get straight back into it and dug myself a bit of a hole. Um, Not the first rookie to do that? No. And everyone was like, everyone would come up to me and they'd be like, oh, so you've you've had had an easy week? And then I'd kind of look at them funny and be like, oh, I had a a coffee ride and just got straight back into it. Um, And so at first I thought it was just normal. Um, but uh, yeah, it took, took me a while to bounce back from that tour cause just because of the way I didn't recover. At the yeah, end. I guess these are the things that you learn as you go, though. Yeah, yeah, learn the hard way, learn the hard way. <laughs> but hopefully, I can minimize that this year. So, how's the actual racing been? We caught up with you after your Oz summer, yep. Then you went to the UAE, um, and you did Settimana, Copa Bartoli yep. in Italy, and a couple of one dayers up north. Mm. What's been the major difference from racing in Australia to, to racing on the, on the continent? Yeah, for sure. Um, the biggest thing for me is uh, like the type of rider I am. I'm a climber, um, but uh, and I often come into the races with good legs. Um, but I've quickly worked out that it's it's a positioning into the bottom of the climbs, and you can't get away with it being in the middle of the pack. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a race to the hill, and then it's a second race up the hill. Um, and so that first part, I'm definitely learning. Um, that copy. Uh, definitely noticed it a lot. We're on small, narrow roads. Michelin and Scott had it pretty well lined out and uh, everyone else was just on the receiving end because it would just be squeezing and um, pretty technical, hilly hilly part of the world. Um, so on a course that I thought I'd do well at, I actually got pretty well handed to. Um, and that was a bit of a reality check for me. Um, I was happy with how I time trialed um, at the copy Bartley, but... Uh, and then same again with the UAE as well. Um, that was a, a pretty solid week. That was a week of crosswinds. I'd never ridden in the crosswinds before. Wow. Um, so Straight in the deep end into the Middle East. Yeah, it was a bit of... <laughs> yeah, I felt like I was at school that week and I had seven days to learn how to ride in the wind. And by the end, I was uh, competent, perhaps. Yeah. But definitely not my strength. But I was a lot better than I was at the start. Um just working, and I was pretty stoked that I was able to to do the to do that tour because I had a had a week of crosswind course, um, and now I can kind of hold my own, perhaps. Um, and and the racing up north, you won down to twenty three Flanders. Hmm. What was it like racing in the pros up there? It was a different story. Yeah, I mean, uh, I didn't race the senior tour of Flanders um, or or Paris Roubaix or anything. 
but uh, but those northern classics they yeah. all quite have the same characteristics. Yeah, like Brabant's Peel, the um, the finishing circuits of Brabant's Peel is actually really similar to the Under Twenty Three Tour um, Tour of Flanders. But uh, one thing I notice is that you have a bunch of guys that are actually dedicated and working for one man, um, and it's just a race into every corner. And then so with that, the, the bunch gets strung out. And if you're 30th wheel, um, you know, you can't be uh, you can't be at the front of the bike race over the top of the climb because you're just simply too far back. Yeah. Um, and so that was, I was actually really happy with uh, Brabant's appeal because uh, I was actually comfortable um, being in, I guess, the shit fight for the corner. That was the first race where I was happy to throw my weight around. Um, and my DS, Tom Southern, um, I think was pleasantly surprised and i think clarky um saw a big change and um i mean it did help that i was trying to position the ronde van vandoen winner in betty yeah so perhaps i had a bit more movement uh a room for movement than usual a bit more respect in the peloton because i had him on my wheel but uh yeah i mean it's just it's just really hectic racing up north um it was pretty crazy you just have to like turn the switch on and understand that that's just how it's going to be for four hours yeah um and it was pretty fun Massive adrenaline rush. And then uh, I did uh, Flesh as well. And that was a pretty crazy race. Lots of crashes. Um, like I think everyone at Michelin Scott hit the deck. And uh, it, was, it was just crazy uh, with the crosswinds and, and the nature of the course. Really narrow roads, a lot of corners. Mm-hmm. And then again into a finishing circuit that uh, has like six climbs. Um, and you still had you know 70 really good bike riders who know how to race a bike better than me. So, uh, I mean, unfortunately, that one, Woodsy had a mechanical and I had to give him my front wheel. Well, I tried to give him my front wheel, um, but did it too slowly, so he just got his spare bike and then that was my day done. But, uh, yeah, that race was um, pretty crazy how hard it was for four yeah. hours. Um, it was just grippy all day. <laughs> but it was fun. Yeah, it was uh, pretty cool to ride up the Murder Hoy. Yeah. I think that's how you say it. Yeah. And just, uh, I think on the last lap, I was riding behind Sagan and just watching the crowds go mental for Sagan was pretty sweet. So, so you're saying before that uh, to start with, you were a little bit nervous and <clears throat> didn't quite know what was required to ride up north. But now that you've done it and you said you got a little bit of confidence, do you mm. feel like when you go back up there next time that you might be able to, yeah. to negotiate things a little bit better? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, that type of course is probably the type of rider that I am. Um, it's kind of hard one day races yeah yeah I'm, i wouldn't say um i mean perhaps it's just a reflection of my training but i wouldn't say that i'm like a an alps person um like a climber like that sort of just a hard day rolling and then proper bergy finishes um i'd say that's my type of type of rider but um being able to see those roads and then also i was with the team for liege um i, I didn't race it i was first reserve but the team um thought it was pretty valuable for for me to see the recon see the roads um and watch the guys and see what it's all about for next year um and it definitely gives me a a lot of motivation for next year and uh particularly having two two good rides with flesh and revance pill i know that like i can be up there yeah in the final um but it's definitely it's one thing to be there and then it's one thing to actually be contesting the win um but uh yeah it gives me a lot of motivation to know that i like can mix it with the guys um and i didn't really know until i came over here whether i was going to be able to do it and that's pretty because the that's unknown pr- isn't it's it? pretty daunting yeah like when i was speaking to you uh last time back in oz uh like the classic question the people would be asking would be are, are you ready for it it's like i'd have to say I yes but the only way i was really going to find out was by doing it yeah um and yeah now that i'm here done a few races still got a lot to learn mm-hmm. um but yeah, I can say that uh, I think I fit in, but it'll just continue to, continue to, uh, to improve. But uh, yeah, I'm having fun. So, What was it like being a part of the group at Liège? Like obviously that's one of the biggest races on the calendar and you've got guys like Woods mm. there riding with one leg warmer. Um, yeah. what, what was it like being, being around the group and what did you learn from, from those senior, senior guys? Yeah, well, we spent five days in uh, a hotel that was just next to La Redoux. Um And we spent a fair bit of time rolling around the course and we did one recon ride. And uh, 
just riding with the guys and seeing um, the spectators on like the recon day. It was just pretty cool to see how excited they got over seeing uh, the guys in pink. I think there was a bit of hype around the team after Betty Ol's win yeah, at Flanders. For sure. And uh, they had a pretty good hit. They had a pretty uh, hit team there. So, um, like, we had Martinez as well. And also, um, like, Tannel had an awesome one at Liège. He was off the front there. And also Clarkie as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the day itself of Liège... Uh, I didn't want to get too involved. Obviously, I wasn't racing, so I wasn't a focus for them. So I just went and did, um, yeah, five hours in that in that weather. Um, so I just went out to the course and rode about an hour ahead of them, and then saw them at the finish yeah. where the buses were, and then got the bus back. But uh, for me, it was just all observing what was going on um, and just seeing how hectic it was, and seeing the guys roll into the finish, look, looking the way they did. It's just like far out like that's what it takes like, to be in the front of yeah, the age yeah. yeah and you know they they all have a shower they head and you know they're ready to go again so it's pretty cool yeah um and and someone like mike like he was uh mike's uh he has pretty high standards himself and he was like pretty frustrated to lose the wheel um over the last climb at liege you could tell he was emotional about it, but uh, on the bus when he came in initially, then he just switched off, said thanks to all the guys and was happy again because he, he knew he gave it his all. But um, yeah, it was cool just to be to be observing from a slight distance and kind of still be a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So when we last spoke, you were heading to a training camp. Did that end up mm-hmm. happening? What, yep. was, what was it like at the training camp? Because this season EF have had like – a massive year already like yeah. winning the ronde clarky um was second at amstel and you've won some other things around the world as well what what was the the feeling in the in the camp was there anything that you felt was like was special or what's it like in the group yeah yeah um well for starters we stayed in a pretty nice little like resort hotel thing it's called the like the pga golf course um Did you get a few rounds in no, we didn't. Uh, some guys did though, actually, just before <laughs> UAE. I think Clarky and uh, Julius Vandenberg had a had um had had to go. I think they did. Oh, they they didn't play play the rounds, but uh, what's it called? The driving range. Yeah. That's it. Um, they had a, had a bit of a go there, but uh, there was definitely a, a really good energy to to the camp. I think it was about four or five days long, um, and this was just before we headed off to the UAE tour. So we did some team time trial work. Mm-hmm. And we had some of the sponsors um, as kind of their head of staff come and visit, talk about their products and basically explain the relationship that they want with the team. And that was all pretty serious. Um, and then basically we had this big dinner room where all that would happen. And it was uh, it was a really busy four days. Just obviously we have like, it was almost like a race day. You have a schedule, breakfast, ride, dinner, and then everything in between. There was like four guys that have to go and do this interview. Um, it was really quite... Quite intense yeah quite yeah. the operation um and obviously with a new sponsor and in ef and a new sponsor with rafa uh, it all like a lot of the riders were saying it all just felt like a brand new team yeah obviously with all the same faces but there was definitely a really good energy and i could tell um even just based off the previous year that everyone was was pretty excited for for what was to come and um yeah it was uh i guess the team's been riding pretty well um since the training camp and yeah it was great to see at the training camp as well how many people are involved uh with like outside of just the riders itself it's a big operation isn't it it was like three times the amount of people yeah as to riders and you just it's pretty cool and it makes you really appreciate what you do because you have that small army of people just to support you riding your bike yeah which is pretty cool and it was a bit surreal actually um at the time yeah What's the feeling like for you? You haven't been involved in these wins, but do you still get like a a good feeling, like good energy from from your teammates winning? Yeah, absolutely. I was yeah sitting in this living room watching Alberto go solo on the Paderberg. Yeah. And I think my heart rate got up to like 140 just sitting there. <laughs> and when I saw that, I, like I don't usually get that excited or get that like adrenaline rush watching TV um, or at least watching sport. And that's when I realized just how like almost emotionally invested I am into seeing the team go well and to see the riders go well and the staff and just to 
see your space uh, perform like that is pretty cool yeah, on no what doubt. is perhaps the biggest one day race of the year yeah um and then yeah even recently the amgen tour of california seeing tj um yeah in yellow and then seeing the team ride the way they were and then also to see the new the new rookie who's actually younger than me um yeah sergio uh pretty impressive yeah no like doubt um he's obviously an unreal talent it's just cool to see that now he's on board with the team and it's exciting to think of the possibilities with him but uh yeah i think i answered the question yeah oh, a bit of tangent. <laughs> what do you think like the future of the team is like what's the direction have you been you've got a three-year deal don't you yeah so obviously there's some good investment for the younger riders yeah do you feel that i don't know they're kind of working on on the younger group and looking to build with with the crop that they have i think so um i wouldn't say we have a super young squad uh relative to some mm. um but i know yeah i mean for me i'm signed for three i know for sergio he's for three as well yeah um but uh i know traditionally with the team and and with slipstream is that once a, a rider shows his potential within the team uh they're pretty quick to re-sign a new contract yeah um they don't wait until the following year to then negotiate they just do it there and then which is i think a good a good for the spirit of the team just to show that once once you do show you're good enough then uh and you're kind of part of the the pink family you can like kind of hang in there um with the contracts and stuff but yeah i mean i don't know too much about it to be honest um but uh, i'm just learning that space what about for you for the rest of the season what's what's the the races that are on the cards and what's the big yep. the big goals now you've had a couple of months here yeah uh so my next race is tour of norway and then I have a week off and then I do the Dauphiné. Um, and then from there, we kind of re uh, reassess. I mean, being the Neo Pro, I think uh, I'm one to, to fill the gaps. Yeah. Um, and for me, to, to over, I'm not trying to think about my race program too much. Just trying to stay healthy and fit so that if I do get the call up, um, that I'm ready to go. But uh, a personal goal of mine would be to, if I do have some time off in July, to go up to altitude. Uh, to Andorra to have a look and uh, hopefully be going well enough to do the Vuelta. I'd love to do the Vuelta. Yeah. Uh, I think that steep climbs, uh, whether whether or not a Grand Tour suits me, but I don't think it really suits any, any human being, to be honest. No, especially um, not a youngster like yourself. Yeah, yeah. But again, I've just got to be fit enough um, during that time of year to, to be in the, the list for the Vuelta. Yeah. That would be a massive goal of mine and... This might be a bit of a long reach, but um, like you saw Schultz at the Volta last year and then he got to do Worlds. Um, and same with like Jai Hindley. Yeah. He did, had a pretty good Volta. But uh, yeah, I mean, for me, I, I haven't had a, had a word to the staff about uh, my back half of the season. Um, so yeah, I'll just take it as it goes. Cool. Thanks for joining us, James, on the podcast and thanks for housing us in your nice apartment and um, all the best for the rest of the season. Oh, thanks for coming over. No worries. Cheers. Cheers.